Hello, welcome to Unlock the Bible Now. I'm Brother Scott Mitchell. Thank you for joining us today. And we appreciate always you would tune in or watch the video or listen through the app. And we're very grateful for your support, for your prayers, and just the participation that you share with us. It edifies us to know that you are there and we're somehow hopefully reaching you with the Word of God. And so it's another glorious day. Uh, like, like somebody once said, every day is a good day. It's just some days are better than others. But uh, we're grateful for every day that God's grace is extended to this world, knowing that there's a desperate need for those who the Lord loves and sent his son to die for, to hear the truth of the gospel and be saved. Today, we're going to directly talk about one of the things that is the great blessing about being saved, and we're going to get to that here in just a moment. But before we begin, I'll encourage you to join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we come to you grateful and thankful for your mercy, for your grace, for the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you offered up to die for our sins, who willingly took upon us, took upon himself our sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that teaches us, and we ask now that the Spirit would guide us into all understanding, that the things that we say would be according to the truth of thy word, would glorify thy name, would bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ, and would be in one accord with the Spirit. And we ask it would bless each one within the sound of my voice to edification. We ask it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. Today I want to talk about the ages to come. We are promised to be a part of the ages to come. Aren't you curious as to what that entails? Let's take a look in the scripture and see what we have to look forward to. I'm using a Tyndall print version of the King James Bible. I'll use that to call out page numbers for reference. And we're going to start in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. It's page 1702. And we'll start reading in verse 4. The Apostle Paul writes this letter and he says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now we're going to find that a lot of this has to do with the inheritance. And while he doesn't use the word inheritance in these verses that we read, there's an allusion to it about being raised up together, made to sit together in heavenly places. But for now, we're going to focus on the term ages to come. There are ages to come. The word age is ion in Greek. It's translated as world age, depending on the context. So you could say there are worlds to come, and that would be true. But ages in the sense of time. <clears throat> now, we think about eternity as timeless. And in a sense, it is. But there's ages in eternity. God comes from eternity where time doesn't exist. He created time. He created it for man, for his creation, and we will be a part of that because it's all going to culminate in God's glorious kingdom, and we've been made a part of that. Look with me in the book of Colossians chapter 1. Maybe just turn a few pages over to your right, probably not more than 10, to Colossians chapter 1. You'll find it on page 1715, and we'll start reading in verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet, fitting, or you know, apt or prepared, to be partakers of the inheritance, there it is, of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and he's talking about the Lord, the Father, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. There's so much blessedness in those passages. We could spend hours just talking about that. But the key here is we've been translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is king of kings and lord of lords. And he will reign from a throne. He's seated at the right hand of God right now in the third heaven. But there will be the inheritance 
that's going to come down and it's part of his kingdom. Now let's take a moment and look at the word translated there because that's an interesting word, translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And we think of translation as like a, a, a from one language to another. But the Greek word there is actually methisteme, and I'm probably mispronouncing that. But the Strong's Concordance interprets that as to transpose, transfer, remove from one place to another. Now, that's a fitting definition, I would say. Uh, it's also a change of situation or place, and we're definitely going to see a change in our situation from this corporal, fleshly, carnal body to a glorious body fashioned like unto Christ's glorious body. And then it says to remove from the office of a steward. And in a very real sense, we are stewards of God's gospel, of the mysteries of God, of, of the resources the Lord gives us. But someday we're going to be reigning with him, removed from that office into another. And then it also means to depart from life or to die. And at some point we will be raptured out should the Lord come or should he tarry, we may pass away, but we'll be translated at that point. So the word is applicable in every sense of the word. Uh, we're translated into the kingdom of his dear son, not physically or bodily just yet, but certainly judicially. And in the spiritual sense, that is where we shall be and we shall reign with him when our stewardship comes to an end. Go back with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 1 again. Or I should say chapter 1. We weren't there. We were in 2. It's page 1701. And look with me in verse 9. Paul writes, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, notice time and ages are still references to temporal things, uh, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Well, we know it's the kingdom of God's dear son, the kingdom of God, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory. So we can unpack a few things here. We have an inheritance in Christ. We are going to be the administers of that inheritance in the ages to come because we're going to be to the praise of the glory of his grace. Uh, it's according to his purpose. We're predestinated unto it. In other words, the moment you believed, God planned that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, and I would argue that's the fulfilling of all prophetic scripture, and that must be completed before the age is to come. So right now, I would argue, we're in the dispensation of time. And when we reach the dispensation of the fullness of times, which I'm going to show is at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ, that's when he's going to gather together in one all things in Christ. And that one is not necessarily one location because it's all the kingdom of God. But as we're going to see shortly, there's going to be a new heaven, a new earth, and a heavenly city of which we will partake. And so all of that is coming for us in the ages to come, and we're going to be a part of that. As I said, we're going to administer something there. We're going to be co-reigning with Christ. Look with me in verse 13. We left off in 12, and they made reference to those who first trusted, in whom ye also trusted. So there's others that believed, as Paul writes to the Ephesians. And when did they trust? After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, praise God for the Holy Ghost, which is the earnest guarantee of our inheritance, there's the word again, over and over again, until the redemption of the purchased possession, when the Lord comes to gather us home, unto the praise of his glory. It always amounts to the praise of his glory. The inheritance is so important. We've been sealed by God's Holy Spirit unto it, that we might be to the praise of his glory in the ages to come. He's got this all mapped out. 
We're not going to deny the Lord his glory, his praise. Therefore, you're sealed. That should give you all comfort of assurance and knowing that you can't lose your salvation because God's not going to be denied his glory in you whom he redeemed through the blood of his only son. Now, go me to chapter 2. We have to focus on the inheritance because the ages to come revolves around that. It is the kingdom of God, but we've been made heirs, joint heirs with Christ. That word is so important. It's just not given enough uh, attention, I think, in most teachings in the churches. We are on page 1703, Ephesians 2, and I want verse 19. These very Ephesians that he said, ye also trusted, in the past they didn't have hope. But now they do. And so he says in verse 19, Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners from God's promises and blessings, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So I I love that. No longer a stranger, not a foreigner to God, but a fellow citizen, implying we have citizenship in a country, a nation, a city, something that belongs to God, his kingdom, a kingdom. And of the household of God, not just a subject in the kingdom, but a member of the royal family. Can you imagine that? We are of royal lineage through adoption in Jesus Christ. That's not all, verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now we're starting to see something, the household alluded to it, Because where do you find a household living in a house somewhere? Well, now we're alluding to a building built, verse 20, upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone of this building, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Well, look at that. This building of which we're a part is a temple of the Lord, in whom also ye are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit's drawing us to be added to the building, edifice. And as we grow, we're making up this temple of the Lord. And it's a habitation of God. The inheritance is actually a city. It's the city that is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. We'll see that. And it's, it's a building unlike any other. It's a 1,500 cubic square mile building that you can see in Revelation 21. And we're going to go there shortly, not to look at all the dimensions of the, the city itself, um, which I encourage you to read in your own time to just see what a great blessing that is. But it's almost like it's the central part of the kingdom of God. There's going to be a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem, which Paul said is the mother of us all. And Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of that city. And it's so important. It's so glorious. It's such a reflection of God's majesty and power and grace and love and mercy and glory that it is Stated by Paul in Romans 8, let's turn there. Just If I try to quote it, I'll mess it up. And I don't want to do that. Romans chapter 8, page 1643. And notice verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God by adoption and sealed by the Spirit. And the Spirit even bears witness that we are in that family, the household of God. And if children, verse 17, then heirs. We can't get around that word, inheritance. Heir is the root of inheritance. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We're going to co-own everything he created. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, the word suffer there comes up and we think, well, I don't know if I want to suffer. Nobody likes suffering. But believe it or not, the church has been suffering. The church has been in tribulation from the very beginning. From the moment Jesus Christ was crucified, he's the head of the church. 
Paul said we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. He wasn't talking about necessarily the time of Jacob's trouble, although that is a part of some suffering that's going to happen among some of the saints in Christ. But what he says in verse 18 is the thing that kind of blows my mind. He says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And when is that glory going to be revealed in us? In the ages to come. It's to the praise of the glory of his grace. But God's glory in us is Christ's glory revealed through us in the ages to come. And not like we're just sitting on a shelf like a trophy. We're going to be doing things. And we'll get to that maybe near the end. But let's talk about the ages to come and when they begin. As I stated, I believe they will begin when the dispensation of the fullness of times ends. I would argue that's when God creates a new heaven and a new earth because all prophetic time will then have been fulfilled. The dispensation of the fullness of times. And then it says he's going to gather together in one all things in Christ. Well, here it is. Go to Revelation chapter 21. The gathering together is when the Lord literally comes down with his city, new heaven, new earth, no more sea, nothing dividing creation from the creator. And you'll find it on page 1816. Revelation 21, verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I'm going to make the case, or I would argue and make the case, that this is at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ, after the devil's cast into the lake of fire, after the final judgment. And then we see this. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I believe he's talking about the frozen sea of glass, the deep, that separates God's throne in the third heaven from the rest of creation. Verse 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. It's a city. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. A tabernacle is a dwelling. It's going to be God's habitation, right? He's going to dwell with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And he's not just talking about Israel here. Israel has been his people and restored as a nation and received their atonement and served him as a kingdom of priests for a thousand years now in the millennial reign of Christ. This has already passed, and now all mankind are redeemed, all that's left. We're going to talk about those that are not a part of this in just a moment. And it's unfortunately a a sobering thought that we have to face in the ages to come, but it's very much a part of it. However, here we see God coming down to dwell with all mankind. They shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. That's amazing. In the ages to come, we will occupy the city which is an habitation of God through the Spirit that Paul referred to in Ephesians 2. Here we will be to the praise of the glory of his grace. And I don't mean to say we're going to never leave there. We may have other things to do, but the nations on the earth that are saved are going to see us there and glorify God through his glory that's revealed in us. Now, as I mentioned, there's a sobering thought, and it's, by the Spirit of God and the wisdom of God, that he placed this verse where he did. And I'll explain why I think that was so important here when we get near the end. But skip down with me to verse 6. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. It's like it's all come full circle, and now we go into the ages to come. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Everyone that ever trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior overcame the world, 
overcame sin and death through his shed blood, overcame the power of the devil and darkness to become a child of light. Some may suffer more than others. Some are going to be persecuted. Some are going to be martyred. Uh, some will have to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. But all that have overcome, God will be our God and we shall be his children. Now watch verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Those who are not in the inheritance, those who are not in the kingdom of God, are without the city in the lake of fire. There's going to be a lake of fire in the ages to come, and it will exist forever in the ages to come. And it's that's why I said it's very telling and important that this verse is placed where it is because we're going to see something about this that is significant and why we should have such a burden in our heart to reach those that are lost. We can't make anybody believe. It is totally up to them. God gave them free will to trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But we are here while there's time to try to reach them and share the gospel with them so they don't end up in this horrible place. He said it's the second death, and it is the result of the judgment that took place in Revelation 20. Turn back a page, about page 18, 15, and we'll start reading in verse 12. This is the great white throne judgment. We can actually start reading in verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And this is right before he creates a new heaven and a new earth. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And the indication is it's the, they're emptying the contents of death and hell. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Those who are without the new Jerusalem, the city, are in the lake of fire. And I'm talking about really they're outside the kingdom of God because God's going to come down to dwell with men in the city on the heaven, on, in the new heaven and the new earth. It's all united. He's going to gather together in one all things, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, in, into one. So the heaven and the earth will come together in a way that it was originally, probably before the flood, the first flood of Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And the difference is going to be that tabernacle, that heavenly city is going to come down and be on the earth and basically uniting heaven and earth together. And everybody on the earth and in the city and in heaven are the redeemed of the Lord or his heavenly host or whatever. But uh, those that are without the city are in the lake of fire. Now, this is not including the rest of saved humanity on the planet, but only those whose names are not in the book of life. So it's not like there's going to be a bunch of people running around outside the city committing sins. I've actually heard some people teach that. I disagree with that based upon some other passages, which we'll read in just a moment. But if we go back to Revelation 21 and look in verse 27, we already read that the fearful, the unbelieving, and on and on uh, will have their part in a lake of fire in verse 8. Page 18, 17, look in verse 20. Actually, for, let's look in verse 26. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. This is the whole chapter kind of describes the city. So I'm not going to go into all those details. It's a beautiful thing uh, and it's unimaginably gorgeous. But the nations that are saved are going to be on the planet Earth and they're going to bring their glory and honor into the city to, to honor the Lord. And watch verse 27. 
and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. The point being, only those that are saved by grace through faith, that are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that are righteous according to God's purpose, and that have their names written in the book of life are going to have access to go into the city because that's where we're going to find the tree of life is. And that's how they'll eat and live forever. Well, we've already seen if there's people that are uh, defiled or work abomination or maketh a lie or whatever, they're in the lake of fire. So we're not talking about sin is still running around in the new earth. There's, there's no place for that. Um, this would imply that all the things that cannot enter into the heavenly city in verse 27 are already in the lake of fire, verse 8. Apparently, the reason they're listed as not entering in is twofold. Number one, they cannot because they're in the lake of fire and their names are not found written in the book of life. But there's another reason it's mentioned there in this beginning of the ages to come. And this is the part that's hard to handle in a sobering thought. But those that are in the lake of fire will see the city and God and the Lamb thereof and know that they rejected God's offer of salvation. They'll be there, all whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, along with Satan and his angels and the demons, the unclean spirits and everything else. And we know that based on Matthew 25. Go with me there. To Matthew chapter 25. Now what's already welling up in some minds out there, I'm sure, is this feeling that what if somebody I know, what if a dearly beloved family member who died lost is in the lake of fire? Am I going to have to see them suffer eternally in torments and flames? That's a valid question. So let's see what the Bible says about this. First of all, back to the point of knowing Satan and his angels are there. Page 1421, Matthew 25. I just want to skip down to verse 41 for the con. Uh, there's a context about a judgment that the Jesus Christ will do among the nations. And some are going to be turned into hell. And it says in verse 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This is not hell. Hell is not the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It's the lake of fire. Satan, his angels, and those whose names are not found written in the book of life, and the demons and the antichrist and the false prophet, all will be in the lake of fire forever. And there'll be no end to that. I want you to see this. It's Again, a part of the ages to come, so we need to address it in Revelation 19. It's not a pleasant thought, but it's something that hopefully will compel us to desire to get off of our duff and find a way to serve the Lord so that you can reach somebody. Revelation chapter 19 is on page 1814, and notice with me in verse 19. This is when the Lord comes back, right at the beginning of the thousand-year reign of Christ. Verse 19, And I saw the beast, Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army, meaning Christ. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And as far as I can tell, they're the only ones that get thrown in alive. All the rest are killed first. Uh, well, maybe later Satan will be cast alive. And I would imagine the angels too, uh, the fallen angels. But the beast and the false prophet will apparently be the first occupants of the lake of fire. There's nobody there yet. I don't even think it's been created yet. And there's a case to be made that it was, uh, it's going to, the land of Idumea is going to be turned into the lake of fire. But that's the subject for another study. Skip back down to Revelation chapter 14. Notice chapter 14, page 1808. 
during the middle or, or during the time of tribulation of the seven years, we see this in verse 9. And the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, and we just read that the false prophet was cast into the lake of fire along with the beast because he deceived men to take the mark. Now, men will willingly do so, but they deceived him to do it, that he deceived mankind to do that. He says, anyone that does that, verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. This mark is bad, folks. Those that get deceived to take the mark are going to willingly do so, even though they're deceived because they would not receive the love of the truth. They shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, in other words, undiluted, into the cup of his indignation. And he, whoever takes the mark, shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Wow. That's, like I said, an extremely sobering thought that those that take the mark of the beast will see the holy angels. They'll see the Lamb of God. They're going to see them in the city and in the new heaven and the new earth. And they'll have no rest. They will be tormented day and night forever. All whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life and Satan and his angels and the demonic unclean spirits. After the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20, all wickedness and unrighteousness will be cast into the lake of fire and it will be present in the ages to come. And here's how we know that. We will see it. Go with me to Isaiah 66. Isaiah chapter 66 is found on page 1080. And we're going to start reading in verse 23. And there's a reference to the new heavens and the new earths in verse 22. Uh, and there's going to be a, basically a renewed heaven and earth uh, in the thousand-year reign of Christ, and then the new heaven and the new earth after the thousand-year reign of Christ. So that's the reason why it's plural there. But in verse 23, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, we're still going to count time, still going to have weeks, still going to have the moon, uh, Shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And that's the nations that bring their glory into the city. Because the Lord is going to be in the city, the tabernacle, the habitation, as he dwells with men. Verse 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Folks, that's just stunning to me. Only in our glorified bodies and renewed minds will we be able to understand God's justice here. We will finally understand the ancient spiritual battle that has taken place all these millennia between Satan and the fallen angels and God. And we will understand that those in the lake of fire chose to be there due to their rejection of the truth. We won't feel remorse or sadness or pain over that. We couldn't, and we'll find out in just a moment. But it'll be God's perfect justice taking place there. And when we see them, we'll look out, to, and I'm not sure what our thought process will be at that moment, but we'll understand this is right, this is just, this is what they deserve. This is what should have happened. It goes so much deeper than us just thinking about somebody drinking or playing cards or doing some sins that we think are bad. This has to do with following and aligning ourselves with Satan and his angels. And they deserve every bit of the punishment they're going to get. Now that reference there to the worm shall not die and neither the fire be quenched is what was the subject of what Jesus Christ was warning about in the book of Mark. Go to Mark chapter 9. And you know, if he had said it one time, it would have been sufficient. 
It would have been true. It would have been important. But he emphasized it three different times in Mark chapter 9, which you're going to find on page 1449. And look at how sobering a warning this is. Verse 43, just jumping into the context here. Christ said, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Now, granted, he was talking about the kingdom saints and the tribulation saints and things like that. But the application of the kingdom of God is still real. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Well, we know that's the lake of fire. That hell is the lake of fire. Verse 45, And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life, twice he called it life, eternal life, than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And this is the second death. Verse 47, here's the third warning. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God, life, with one eye, than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Their worm, possessive, I shudder to think what that might mean. Is it they'll be tormented in addition to the flames with a worm that consumes them as they decay and renew every day? Or are they going to degenerate into a worm-like creature themselves, those that are in the lake of fire? Whatever it is, it's a horrifying thought. But three times Jesus warned of the lake of fire and why it's better to suffer to enter into the kingdom of God than to end up in this place. And while there's a specific context here to those that are going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble, and it would be better for them to lose a hand and be persecuted and put to death rather than take the mark of the beast, we can still make the spiritual application of how horrible a place the lake of fire is and how glorious a place the kingdom of God is in comparison and why Paul could say the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. So moving back into the better things in the ages to come, the more positive thoughts, and it's important that we talk about this other thing that's negative because it, it is the driving factor that should motivate us to want to share our testimony with those that we meet when the Lord gives you an opportunity and a door of utterance. But the reason why we're not going to feel grief or remorse or pain or sorrow at seeing people we might have known in the lake of fire is going to be found in Revelation 21 again. So let's turn back there. Getting back to the joyousness of the ages to come in our inheritance. Page 1816, Revelation 21. And notice verse 4. Right after it says that God dwells with men, and they will be his people, and he shall be their God. Verse 4 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Only by God's grace can we understand his justice. He will take away anything that would cause us to grieve or be in pain at the thought of people in the lake of fire. We might sorrow to see them go in at the moment that it happens, perhaps. I don't know when the sorrow may be, but at some point there's going to be tears and God's going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. Perhaps he's going to give us a mind that will not remember or something. He's going to make all things new, like a brand new mind. I don't know. I don't mean erasing any memory of who we are or what we were or anything like that. But God is able to do greater things than we can imagine. In the ages to come, in spite of the justice of the lake of fire, we will only know 
joy, and peace. Look with me in Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. Page 1648. Just jumping right down into the passage, it says in verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And we want to try to equate justice with our sense of it. God's sense of justice is completely different from ours. We can't even figure it out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? Man deigns to think he can tell God a thing or two. You know that? What hubris. Or who shall first, uh, who hath first given to him, to God, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. The Lord didn't need anything from us. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Remember, we're going to be to the praise of the glory of his grace in the ages to come. It appears that we shall see the wicked in torments eternally, but only our glorified bodies and renewed minds will be able to handle seeing this. God's perfect justice being fulfilled. There's no possibility of us feeling remorse, anguish, or regret over those that are in the lake of fire because we're going to be, I could say the word consumed, if you will, with God's glory, with the praise of the glory of his grace, with the glory that he shall reveal in us. And it's going to be forever in the ages to come. I don't think we're going to go see people in the lake of fire every moment of the day. It's from one new moon to another. It's going to be on, on a some sort of a basis, but it's not every moment of every day. It won't even enter into our mind. It'll be like looking and seeing, hmm, yeah, that's, that's what they, that's God's justice there. We'll see it. We won't have thoughts of those kind that we would think of right now. Right now we think of regret. Well, let that drive you to compel you to serve the Lord and find a way to let your testimony be made known. Because the kingdom of God, we're not going to know anything but righteousness and peace and joy. Look in chapter 14. Just turn a couple of pages over, and I'll start to wrap this up. Page 1651, Romans 14, notice verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's all we're ever going to know. Righteousness and peace and joy. And if we wonder, how is this going to be? How can this take place? How is God going to accomplish this? Well, who has known the mind of the Lord, right? How past finding out are his ways? And even more importantly, go with me to Ephesians chapter 3, page 1704. And notice with me in verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. World without end. The kingdom of God will never end. Throughout all ages. There's ages to come forever. We'll never cease to experience. Amen to that. What glorious experiences await us in the ages to come? What worlds to explore? What truths to discover? What music, art, literature, buildings, and inventions to create for God's glory? We'll be too busy rejoicing and being joyous in the light of God's glory to even worry about the things that are past. The Bible says the former things will not be remembered. Isn't that something? Don't you want to be a part of this? How could you refuse such a gift, the free gift, that just trust that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised again, believe on him as your Lord and Savior, and you can be a part of this inheritance in the family of God in the ages to come. I don't know how anybody could turn that down. My prayer is that you would accept it and receive the free gift 
and trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Don't end up in the lake of fire. What a horrifying thought. Trust Jesus Christ now. You don't know that you have one more breath in you. You're not guaranteed another heartbeat. But there's a promise that if you will call on the Lord, you will be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you so much for listening today. Until next time, I hope you will rejoice in your salvation. Thank you for listening today. If you're enjoying these messages and would like to support us, you can make a tax-deductible donation through our Unlock the Bible Now app, which is free to download from your device's app store, or go to utbnow.com. We appreciate you for giving whatever the Lord lays upon your heart. Thank you.